very happy to uh, meet everyone. Uh, to be able to practice together, learn together. Sutra of the Mahayana Buddhism. Time passes very quickly. Now we are entering a new year. Usually, um, we do the uh, oath, more like a um, uh, reminder about time passes very quickly by uh, one of the bodhisattvas. Uh, there's a verse about you know how time passes. Um, there's nothing to be. Um, joyful about our dwelling on uh, when time passes so quickly as our you know, life dwindles. So we need to put our effort in something that um, really matters, you know, our cultivations. A year is not a short time, especially when you are um, progressing in age. Uh, time is very precious. Um, we, are, we need to check, look into our heart, especially like, you know, have we um, getting more compassionate, more um, equal? This is something we need to observe. Where master or teachers can only help you um, to, you know, to introduce these teachings, but the actual act of um, cultivation, the actual act of achieving um, the state of enlightenment is um, you know, up to us. We have to do the, the job ourselves. All this uh, chanting is to practice our heart of equanimity, which is you know, no discriminations and also heart of purity. This is the um, main point of um, chanting Amitabha or the main point of learning Buddhism every new year we have a saying you know it's like a cycle right a cycle starts a new um, at a very start of a new year uh, what starts a new something we need to talk about Buddhism talks about you know, reincarnations and sometimes they talk about, not sometimes, they talk about um, who was I before my parents gave birth to me? Who were you before um, we, we were born? And if we understand the teachings, then our um, purity, you know, if we listen to Dhamma a lot and we understand that this is actually um, uh, purity uh, of mind, uh, our source of our existence is our true nature. So when we say cycle anew, we don't just look at the outside, we also think about our state of mind, our state of cultivation, our state of being, have we improved, have we improved, have we getting more and more, you know, less uh, subject to the uh, destruction of the outside. Uh, just like, you know, every cycle, we need to renew, rejuvenate, um, amend, make amends on our wrongdoing in the past and improve from that knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we should not stop at where we are and not improving not advancing ahead, uh, especially in terms of cultivation, it's always progressing, it's always ongoing, always breaking through the mode, breaking through the um, boundaries uh, to get better and higher version, better version of yourself. And when you cultivate Buddhism, it's um, the aim should be to be a, a Buddha, no less than that. You should not aim anything lesser than becoming a Buddha. And in Confucius teaching, they also have mentioned about that in the, um, you know, the great learnings. Uh, and they talk about um, the path of great learning, a person who truly achieved greatness. Um, they start uh, 
hearing, clarifying their heart, clarifying their intention, and then um, pushing it towards the limit, the ultimate end of knowledge, ultimate end of wisdom, perfection of wisdom. And it has to be done from inside, it cannot be done from the outside. How do we cultivate from the inside? We need to begin with uh, letting go of the distractions that muddies our progressions. Especially when we start from, you know, our most current, most um, recent problems, and from there we need to clear out all the distractions. Slowly, slowly progressing towards you know, uh, clearing, clearing the um, path towards our uh, true nature. So when I was just talking about the situation, technical situation of microphones not connecting with him. So, yeah, all good. So back to the point, um, how do you help others? How do you help others um, be aware, be awakened? You need to be awakened yourself. Uh, same logic, if you need to help others, if you wish to help others, if you want to help others, we need to start helping ourselves, getting out of the situation, getting out of the um, confusion, ignorance that we're in. So for example, a person will love themselves, will take care of themselves, they will not give rise to any anger, they will not throw any tantrum, right? Like in the Buddhist saying, well, a, a thought, a slither of anger rises in your mind, burns throughout a forest worth of your uh, merits. That means no matter how many merits you have, if anger arises, if you allow an anger arise in you, then everything that you work on, you know, accumulate the merits that you accumulate will be burned away in an instance. For example, like someone you know criticize you or whether true or not, we if we allow anger to come out, as in I don't like this, you know, I hate this, or I I, I don't like the way you say, etc. etc. You already lost your progression because that's the first step, that's the first obstacle, right? And also from not just mentally, you also hurts your body if you get too um, easily, easily angered. Before we start talking about the teachings, sharing about the teachings, we should always use it on ourselves first. Practice what you preach before we preach, right? We practice it and then we preach it. That's how people would listen. Um, yes, we want to help a lot of people, our families, our friends, our relatives, but first thing we need to do is to improve ourselves. Like the way we say things, the tone. Only then our words have weight. You know, our words worth a goal, weight a goal. Because we what we say we do it is backed up by our action. For example, our anger, we getting less prone to anger, getting less prone to temper. And with that, uh, our advice to others will be more powerful. And always go back to the principle. My, all the venerables, all the masters, all the teachers can only give you the ideas, the concepts, the path, you know, show you the path, but the actual walking, the actual practicing, the actual coming the obstacle is done by yourself, no one else. So how do we awaken? What do we awaken from? Start from the people we encounter, the interactions that we came across in everyday scenarios. Have we improved in our encounter with others? The way we react, react the way we um, react to the situation. For example, the people in the past, they really work hard and work hard to cultivate themselves, work hard to better themselves. So how do they do that, right? One of the um, way they do it is to have a list to record their doings, good and bad. We call it the books of merits and votes. So everything I did every day, how many merits, how many votes. So to give yourself a bit of a tally. Um, 
So the practice there is can be categorized into main and side. Main for us pure land practitioners, we aim for pure land, we aim for enlightenment by going to pure land. However, it has to be assisted by cultivating the good deeds, eliminating the unwholesome deeds, you know, the deeds that obstruct you from being more calm and more wise or compassionate. So in back to our main practice, um, how do you become Buddha? How do you go to Pure Land? How do you actually cultivate that level? Start from our intention. There is a saying that direction is more important than effort because when you have right direction, your effort will be you come out naturally. So we need to have the right direction. In Buddhism, we call it body heart. We need to invoke that um, body heart. Uh, have you guys heard of? The, I mean, have you guys read the um, uh, statement and article by a monk in Qing Dynasty on how to invoke a body heart? So, Venerable Ma, uh, Mas, Venerable Sing An from Qing Dynasty. Um, he is an accomplished practitioner. He has in entered the state of compassion into its own. You know, there's no I, there's no ego in there, melted with everyone else. Um, and he wrote these very touching articles about how to invoke a heart of body, you know, a body heart. Um, when you read it, um, when you read his article, you feel his sincerity. So start from how to invoke that heart of you know, body heart to help others, to help yourself. Start from your teacher. Think of their goods they did to you. Think of your own parents' goods they did to you. You know, gratitude. Gratitude towards people. Start from the people who are close to you. So another closer example to our time is um, Mr. Huang, Nian uh, Huang, and uh, he has also he talk about how do we become more um, compassionate. There are practices that help us to improve our chances of gaining enlightenment. And we start by having that mindset of gratitude. Uh, how do we be gratitude to his teacher? We always remember the teachings. Always bring it up when you um, you know encounter issues or when you have nothing else. Uh, so in the um, Chinese, as the Chinese people or people influenced by the Chinese teachings, um, we are very fortunate because we have a, such a strong tradition of respect to his teachers. And a lot of these um, teachers, you know, in different in Buddhist tradition, Confucian, um, Taoism. They all, most of them are like Buddha come again, Bodhisattva come again. Basically, they enlightened, they came back to you know, normal, uh, our real and to teach us. And they use Chinese, uh, Chinese tradition supports a lot of that. Um, so we have higher chances, more opportunity to get in contact with these teachers. So, a heart of gratitude is a threat, it's a component of having a body heart. Because we want to define what is body heart. Being gratitude. Gratitude towards who? Towards your teacher. Towards the people who taught you, your mentor. And specifically like towards our you know, master, venerable master who taught us you know, about this existence of these teachings. Sometimes if we you know keep the mind of gratitude, heart of gratitude. Uh, if we do it by ourselves, sometimes uh, it's easily doze off into sleep. Uh, but when you work with other people, like this Dharma place, everyone sit by, sit next to each other, out of it together, they will be more. They will be more. Um, Aware because they saw other people were so diligent, and you know, we don't feel we feel embarrassed for getting a bit slack. So, this is how it works. You know, uh, follow the group, help the uh, make use of the group environment to help you.
to improve. Uh, so like this case, we chant Amitofa together, cultivate together every day, every week. Um, it's, uh, it's a very rare opportunity. Think about every single individual in this group. Everyone has their own unique situations. And in order to make it here, they have to have all the conditions met before they can come here, especially people with families. So to have this condition is a very precious uh, opportunity. So we should take care of these opportunities, take, make good use of these opportunities, uh, make good use of this place. Uh, when we cultivate together, the first principle is to bring out your most sincere part and join, participate, contribute. Um, so in this um, sim like in this sitra, uh, he's talk, uh, Mary was talking about the book, um, the um, commentary on the Infinite Life Sutra. So in the Infinite Life Sutra, this phrase goes, uh, entering the state of emptiness, the state of no asking, no wanting, no wishing. This is the state, a state of um, cultivation. And um, the commentary was done by Mr. Huang, a great uh, come again, you know, the Buddhist of our come again, Buddhist, lay Buddhist. Uh, he talks about this um, emptiness. What is emptiness? Right? In Buddhism, you keep saying um, everything was arise by condition. When the condition met, it becomes. When conditions cease to met, it cease to become. So it stopped being, stop being a thing. So these changes are split of a millisecond, more than that, very quick. Hence, if you dig through the nature of everything, all phenomena, people or things or, you know, all the dynamics between everything, every people in the world, it's empty in that sense. It's, nothing is permanent there. So when we read the Heart Sutra, there is no um, physical, there's no permanent physical presence, there's no um, smell, touch, taste, you know, the five senses, everything we contact through five senses, they are not permanent. And when one can go through this, um, you know, Realization, you know, not just understanding, realization, actually see it, you know, actually realize this state of emptiness. Um, you will be able to understand all the skandhas, which is all the accumulation of, you know, all the existence, all the, all the accumulation of beings, you know, all the beings, things that resulted from many conditions that met together are essentially empty. And hence, surpass the pain, surpass the suffering. Like the best example we can use is television, TV, right? It's, we call it frame per second, right? Every seconds there are thousands of pictures passing by, hence creating an illusion of a moving picture. So our existence is just like the television but much, much faster. Right? In the modern technology, we can achieve hundreds of frames in one second, creating a very smooth motion picture. We call it motion picture. Um, Master Ching Kong has mentioned a lot on this concept uh, when he's talking about uh, Bodhisattva Maitreya, right? About how existence be, what existence is. It's just like a TV, and uh, but much faster. Um, Bodhisattva Maitreya, uh, Maitreya talks about one snap of a fingers have zillions, zillions of thoughts passing by. Basically think of zillions of pictures passing by, making the world that we are living in now. So, what is material? Right? What is physics? What is physical material? It does not exist. It's a constant state of moving, just like the movie. So, this is physical. What about mental situation, mental phenomena, our thoughts? Same, you know, we talk about how fast our thoughts pass by in one second. 
gazillions of thoughts pass by. Uh, so the speed of life and death is actually very quick. I'm not talking about just our lifespan, more like a thought begins and the thought ceases to begin. It's split of a second, not split of a second, gazillions of a second. Hence, we understand if we, right now it's a concept, but if we get a little bit of that, then we understand everything is constantly changing. Right? Body is physics, right? Body is physical being. Um, house is a physical being. Car is a physical being. Right? Property is physical being. All these physical assistants, they keep changing hands, right? They keep changing, they keep deteriorating, needing fixing repairs. So it does our body. And if we only, if we rest our happiness on this kind of ever uh, ever changing um, existence and trying to re catch up with these gazillions of a seconds of change, we will never be happy. Just for example, using the uh, skincare product like SK2, like what I remember saying, using the skincare products um, to achieve youth uh, is not tenable. Right? Yeah. And w another point of our suffering, why we suffer, is because we try to control. We try to think we own this, we try to think we have this, but we don't. Including not just physical property, our relationships with children, husbands and wives, with other people, colleagues, etc. etc. Work, you're trying to control, you're trying to dominate, you're trying to um, manipulate. Suffering came from here. Affiliation came from here. That means affliction, sorry, affliction came from this. Troubles came from this. So Master Ching Fung said the remedy to this suffering, you know, suffering of things not going your way and you know, things keep slipping your grasp, your control is let go. All right, when you're done, let go. So Mr. Huang's commentary on the Sutra has a very core topic. We start with emptiness, understanding nature of things, of people. When emptiness, uh, when we reach the state of emptiness, uh, put it in the other word, not attaching to thoughts, not sorry, not attaching to phenomena, not attaching to the surface. Uh, none of them is forever fixed in one place, perpetual, unmoving. No. Everything is changing, moving. If you're trying to control, it's like trying to control water from flowing. It will keep going. We can't stop it from moving. If there is no... So understanding the emptiness of all matters, right? We no longer be so passive like trying to catch up over something that cannot be captured and hence without that need to control to capture to grasp we let go of the control the control over us has also been released. We are free in a sense because we no longer get bound by this impulse. Right? To give it a name is like um, not doing. The state of undoing. But it's not not doing, but it's undoing. So how do we say that? Um, in Mr. Liao Fan's Four Lessons, right? Changing Destiny, you're still doing the act of giving. That is doing. However, you are not attached to this action of giving. When you give, like Buddhist has a principle, the highest level of giving is you do not attach to the things you give. You do not attach to this, the action of giving. So you, you give, that's it. You don't think about it. You don't dwell on it. You don't dwell on the things you give. You don't dwell on, I give you this. You, know, you owe me this. Nothing like that happens. It's a pure act of giving. So there's no I give, there's no you receive from my gift. There's no I, there's no you. There's no act of giving. But yet you're still doing it. That's how 
of Bodhisattva operates. That's how an enlightened person operates. That's how a free person operates. That's how a person who has achieved purity operates. With that level of operation, the way we live our life, with that kind of level of understanding, even the act of giving may be very few, very humble, very small, but that merit is un limited because of non-attachments. For example, if someone donates millions of dollars to an organization, but they attach to the fame of giving, which means I give you, I want the fame, uh, attached to the action of giving, I give, praise me, attached to the favors that you give, oh, you receive my gift, you owe me. So if that mindset is there, no matter how many millions one people give, it will be limited. On the other hand, if one who did the giving or did the good deeds without attaching the act of giving or act of going, doing good stuff, the merit is endless. That means the merit is limitless. Nothing can control, nothing, nothing limits your um, return because you're not attaching to the return. In a real historical example, like back in pre-Tang Dynasty, mm, the, um, the, yeah, back in, in Imperial China, uh, old, old China, ancient China, there is a king by the name of uh, Liang. You know, King Liang um, loves to donate, especially to the Buddhist temples constructions. He's a Buddhist, but. Um, he attached to the notion of giving when he's doing that. I built thousands of temples, millions of golds and silvers. Um, and Bodhidharma from India, you know, the first patriarch of Zen Buddhism or Chan Zhong in China, Chan Buddhism in China. He met Mr. King Liang and King Liang was talking to him, say, I have donated so much money. Do I have huge merits? And uh, King Liang was not happy when Bodhidharma say, no, because you attach. Sorry, I skip ahead of the story, but yeah. Um, yeah, Bodhidharma replied to him, say, you know, no merits, only fortune, no merits. He didn't say fortune, the Bodhidharma only says no merits. Because these merits can go above six realms, um, but because he's attached to the deeds, as we mentioned, so he's only restricted in a limited, we call it six dreams, limited, limited fortune, limited merits. So if you, we understand the tenets of Buddhism, right? Um, we first three phrase says, do no bad, do all good. And then third one and the fourth one is the important one that makes Buddhism unique. Third one is purify your mind. The fourth one is, that is the Buddhism. Do no bad, do all good, purify your mind. That means no attachments. Understand the emptiness, realize it. That's Buddhism. Everything we did, if we no longer attach to it, we do it purely because we're doing it. Because it's right. Then we'll have the merits to surpass this restriction that we're in now. Hence, pure land. So in the sutra, it says the same concept. Yeah, all the good deeds you did, all the good thoughts you have, all the good intention you have, good speech, only focus on dedicating it to go to pure land. That means you don't attach to, you know, I want this, I want that. You just direct it to pure land. Because like King Liang, if we are like King Liang, we're trying to get a accolades, a acknowledgement for other people's praise from other people of our good deeds. That's a limited mindset. Um, that's limited in six realms. That means limited to um, this situation that you you can't get out of karma. You you limited in six realms. You can't be free. If we bring a close example to us, like people with um, advanced age, you know, 
um, people who usually at this stage in their life they always think when I was a boy when I was a girl that's a lot of rem reminiscence reminiscence thinking back uh, it's trying to you know be a knowledge and that is trying to chase up the past they're no longer there and uh, limited ourselves to that existence that was already long gone right um, so we're limiting ourselves because we're not purifying our mind let ourselves be free from the six rooms so this is the mind of um, Ray. This is a mind of this is a limiting mindset that stuck us to the six realms, stuck us to this condition. So what should we do? What how should we what kind of attitude should we have is do what we need to do, our responsibility or what is good, but do not attach to it. When time's up, let it go. Also, just because we do good deeds and if we attach it, attachment to these good deeds, it's not necessary. You, you won't necessarily be able to reap the reward or enjoy the rewards of your good deeds in the three better realm, human, heaven, asura. Some people enjoy the fruits of their good deeds in animal realms. Best example, pet, pet dog, pet cat. Right? Some of the dogs have a much better living experience than human. They might even be taken to spa, dog spa, dog, dog treatment center. Those are all fortunes. Those are all fortunes that accumulated from good deeds. But they become animal rather than human. So people who cultivate cannot be, a, should not attach, stuck only on the small rewards. What is small compared to become a Buddha. Cannot stuck and limit yourself only to that. You know, good fortune uh, you know. that can be done anytime, anywhere. What is very rare is awareness of not stuck into the good fortune and want to get out of six dreams, to be a Buddha, to be a person who's who's free and able to cultivate good deeds without attaching to it and not giving rise to evil. That's very rare. So that's why it's so venerated. That's why we're, that's why Amitabha is so respected. That's why Buddhism is respected because of this. Like Amitabha Buddha's 48 vows. It's meant for you, no one else, for you, every one of you. Uh, if we just say, oh, it's meant for sentient beings, it's a bit abstract. Sentient beings, what are sentient beings? You, you are sentient beings. You are the target of his, you are, you are why he made the vow. You are why he go through all the hard work of investigating what is the better world and he built it just for you and you. Every one of you, but only for you. So it touches us better if you understand this. With that understanding, with that, hopefully, you know, awareness, um, it will, it will lessen the grip of attachments we have on this world, the six realms. So Mr. Huang, who did the commentary, he came from Beijing and he gave a very good, uh, very, how to say, life, um, good speech, good talk to the students in Beijing. His accent is quite heavy. Um, uh, that's why they, were, they make it into a book in writings. Mm. So, same logic we apply to our scenario in Sydney and then we feel more you know, relevant. You know, teaching feel more relevant to us. So there's a saying there is an analogy. So there's a gate. There's a city and there's three persons entering the gate from three entrances. 
There are three gates into a city. Sorry, there are three gates into a city. There's only one of you. You could not enter the city from three directions at once. Right. So this analogy means that there is three doors to enter the city of enlightenment. First is enlightenment, away, away, awaken. Second is right understanding, you know, right principle, right understanding. Last one is purity. That means not attached. So to put it in Buddhist school, the representative of enlightenment is Zen. You know, you just enlighten, you just aware, very quick. But the second one is the sutra. You know, the Huayan Sutra, the Great Sutras. You read the Sutra, you understand the Sutra. The last one is um, Pure Land. Uh, Pure Land helps you to um, uh, you know, purify your mind, focus on Amitofo. You need to enter from one of the doors. You need to pick a door and then enter it. You can't do it at once from three directions. Um, this is our uh, objective. Um, so, our mission is to get into the city of enlightenment from one door. Um, do not uh, hop around the gates, uh, and, but not going to the destination. People who you know become you know who might who might become you know great monk, uh, great um, practitioners. And the um, uh, 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 very well versed in the teachings, um, you know, who, know, who have the knowledge of all Buddhism. Um, it's like people who hop from door one, door two, door three, but never get in. If you have the mindset of I want to be a great monk, I want to be known as great monk, or I want to be known as you know very well versed in Buddhism. It's just for fame, it's very surface thing. It's not actually trying to get into enlightenment and actually see what the Buddha sees. So, the, so we need to adjust our directions. It's very important to have the right direction before we put the effort. First thing is to let go of selfishness. Because selfishness is the foundation of six dreams, foundation of sufferings. In other words, sufferings. And selfishness came from attaching to the false sense of self. Right, false sense of self is you think you are alone. You are not with anyone. You are not connected to anyone. So you need to protect yourself against others. But it's not. Everyone's connected. Everyone came from the same Buddha nature. So selfishness is the antithesis, which is the opposite of enlightenment. Um, um, Master Ching Kong's. Um, Remedy to this, you know, selfishness is others, work for others, help others, uh, service others, let go of your ego and service others. Um, from selfishness came into attachment of um, wealth, lust, um, fame, food you know, gluttony and like to sleep a lot. Um, this, uh, this indulgence of these desires uh, will lead you to this state of perpetual suffering, in other words, hell. Right? That means you're constantly not satisfied, always craving, 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 and because of that you do a lot of bad deeds and yeah, karma. So, summarize all this into letting go of greed, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and yeah. letting go of the pursuit of wealth, pursuit of fame, pursuit of um, influence. And that state of, that state of emptiness is emptiness, no craving, no wanting, no wishing, state of equanimity. This is 
what we call by emptiness. Right? So people who understand from this point of view, from the state of emptiness into the Buddhist core of Buddhism, came in from the door of enlightenment. You know, they understand immediately the nature of being is is a dynamic of change. Nothing is substance, substantial. Nothing is forever. Everything is moving, shifting. Hence, it's empty in its essence. Be very aware if one person wants to walk into Buddhism from this door of enlightenment and that's understanding of emptiness also includes the understanding of emptiness. The understanding of emptiness is also empty itself. Do not get attached to oh, it's all empty, it's all empty and then not doing anything. That's attaching to emptiness. Right? So not attaching to have, also not attached to not attaching to not have. That's so why it's very hard from this door. And people will say that it's like from Confucius Confucius himself, Kong Kong Lu Ye. Such is the emptiness. Empty the emptiness itself as well. So he's not a normal people. People who are able to say that. He's not ordinary people. Why do we say that? Why do we say, that, okay, we don't attach to fame, don't attach to wealth, don't attach to anything that I have, or my body, my ego. Why do we not attach to emptiness itself? Because people trying to empty what they have, or attaching to what they have, they also ended up falling into the other extremes of attaching, not having attachments, the concept of not having attachments. So that's the tricky part of this door. We cannot attach to either notions of have or have not. Remember, everyone can enter from any of these three doors to enlightenment. Um, but um, a lot of people get stuck when they're trying to enter it because of attachments. Of, they grasp too hard. Right? It's like trying to cross a river using a boat, but you attach to the boat, right? letting go of the boat once you reach the other at the end. Um, so remember, if you want to go in from directly understanding the enlightenment, understanding the nature of enlightenment itself, which is start from emptiness, we also need to let go of the notion of emptiness. Mm. So he further explained, right? Not the state of emptiness, the reality of emptiness. Such is, it is what it is. And if we attach to say, oh, this is empty, this is not empty. So I need to get out of not empty. And you're stuck in the empty. That, and the idea of emptiness becomes another object of your of, of your attachments. So the goal is not to attach. That's the main point. Not to hop from one to another. Not to attach from this to that. And mm. Mm. And because of that, some people who, you know, attach to the idea of emptiness, because it's only meant to help you to get to the state of enlightenment from equanimity. And if people attach to the idea of emptiness itself, it hurts the progress of improving ourselves. It hurts the progress. Uh, because people might give rise to many wrong ideas, hence wrong actions. Like, 
oh, since everything's empty, nothing's permanent. There's no point for me to put any effort in my life. There's no point to, you know, take care of my family or no point to do anything good. That is not Buddhism. That is not the point of learning and dreamness. So, very important to understand the fine line. Right? It's not say calling for inaction or in Chinese tongue ping, you know, life flat, don't do anything. That is not Buddhism. Right. What we mention when we say not the state of undoing, the state of emptiness is do not get attached to it. Right? Like when you give things to others, when you help others, you don't attach to the act of helping, you just do it. So, moving forward, Sutra of Adorn, Flower Adorn, the Great Sutra of Flower Adornment. These ideas, notions, sutras, they are all a bridge. They are all convenience in the sense of getting you across to the other side. They call it convenience, fang bian. Mm. Or tips, some tips to help you getting better, getting there. Some people can say Dharma very well, can grasp you know, the ideas, the mindsets of sentient beings so they can help them, like people. They understand the hearts of the people and use a lot of words to get them across. So they use this ability to help people to get into the door of enlightenment. From wisdom itself, it came from wisdom. Not sitting there and thinking nothing. Or it, it just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a form of wisdom, able to provide convenience for others. Right? Buddhism has a very famous saying, the foundation is, of enlightenment is compassion. Heart, from a compassionate mindset, you want to give convenience for everyone else. You want them to get benefit as much, as soon, as much as possible. Um, another sutra, Sutra of Parinirvana, Sutra of Nirvana. Uh, saying about a idea of enlightenment, idea of how Bodhisattva operates. Wisdom is like your parents. Um, convenience is like the... Convenience is like the door and wisdom is the idea of coming out with a door for people to get in. With pe people with, um, you know, with convenience, you can help a lot of people to understand and to really relate the teaching to their heart. Um, another um, commentary, they use a lot of commentary. Mr. Huang used a lot of sutras, established sutras to prove the point. So another point from another source. Um, People who has deep understanding of emptiness, um, they opened. They open to the understanding, realization of emptiness. The understanding is not shallow, like don't do anything, or not attached to anything. People who really master the understanding and realize the state of emptiness is. They do everything, but they're not attaching to anything. Like, yeah, people who say, oh, I attain Arahant. People who attach to the idea of, I become Arahant, I become Buddha, is not uh, the Buddha, is not the Arahant. Sorry, just waiting. 
Mm. If one gives rise to say, I am out of hand, I have attained. People who have that mindset, oh, I have done this, I have achieved this, I have attained this. Uh, they are not pure mind. Arahan, the first criteria to become Arahan and to even to become a Buddha, start with Arahan, is emptiness, is purity. Purity. Pure mind do not think about I become this, I become that. I have this, I own this, I climb this. No. And because having that mindset, it becomes you stuck with that level. You no longer improve. You're stuck in that state. Uh, how do you improve the state? Letting go of the previous state. Just like movies, right? One picture after another picture keep things moving forward. Uh, if you're stuck in that situation, it's like you're stuck in that frame. You no longer want to move forward. You like this frame so much. You're stuck there. The fastest way to gain to enlightenment is not attaching to any situation, any state of your cultivation. It's how one person gain Anuttara Samya Sambodhi, the um, perfect, supreme, unsurpassed enlightenment. Use another example, going 100 level of skyscrapers. There are two ways, staircase, one level, two level, three level, four level, or elevators, or lifts, sorry, lifts. One button goes straight up. So chanting Amitabha, if you want to attain enlightenment, you can use Amitabha to do that. So how should we chant the name of the Buddha? Don't think of what have I done, or I have done thousands of Amitabha Buddhas chanting, or this, that. Don't think about what future. What am I going to do next, after this? No. Um, do not think of other, uh, uh, do not think of the past, do not think of the future. Only stay on the word Amitabha. This fulfills the cultivation, the principle of not attaching to the past. Um, the past cannot be taken. The past cannot be returned. Right. The future cannot be returned. Um, so once we are aware that we are stuck in the past or stuck in the one seconds ago or stuck in whatever thoughts we have, bring it back to Amitofo, bring it back to the chanting. Also, at the same time, when you chant Amitofo or do meditation, chant Amitofo, do not say, I want to, you know, get rid of all my wandering thoughts. So you thinking about getting rid of wandering thoughts instead of actually getting rid of wandering thoughts. Or I want to attain the uh, one-mindedness with Amitabha. That means enlightenment. And, uh, and you're stuck in there. You get all, you know, how do I do this, how do I do that? All you need to do is just chanting Amitabha. It sounds easy, but it's not. Because we get stuck in that. Yeah, we're trying to do something, but to no avail. All we need to do is walk into the uh, lift, click that button, hold. Hold to that lift. And then all the way to the end. And our lift is Amitabha. That's it. Good people, Amitofo. Bad people, Amitofo. Uh, a very um, favorable condition, Amitofo. A very um, negative situation, Amitofo. This um, convenience, uh, there's two types. Because of even though we understand this is a very simple, straightforward channel all the way to enlightenment, however, it's not simple because sentient beings have different, everyone has different levels of understanding, um, different backgrounds, different understanding. Hence, Bodhisattva needs to give a lot of methods, or Buddha needs to give a lot of different methods. We call it convenience, right? Path. 
to the same destination. Among all the bodhisattvas, the most famous one for you know compassionate and giving a lot of convenience to the others is Bodhisattva Guan Yin, Avalokitesvara, right? And um, and in Chinese Buddhism, we have the top four bodhisattvas, right? That we should emulate our cultivation. First one that we should emulate, we should learn after is Dizang, Siddhikarpa. So what is Siddhikarpa in simple English? It means your heart has treasure, treasure that buries under the earth, right? treasures of the earth, bodhisattva treasures of the earth, Siddhikarpa. What is the treasures of the earth? Our purest, sincere state of our mind, the, 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 you know, the love, the care, like the one we, the closest one we can bring out is our family, you know, the love you have towards your parents when you're just born, or everyone else, no discrimination, no this and that, just pure love. Right, no attachments, no greed, no lust, just pure love. And then towards your siblings. Right. So how do you get started with compassion? Because compassion is the root of enlightenment. Right? It has to start from your family. Start from your parents. And from there you can extend to respect. You respect your teachers, your friends, your mentors. But it has to start from people who are closest to you, right? None other than our parents. That's why in the ten meritorious deeds, uh, Sutra of ten meritorious deeds, they start from be filial to your parents, be loving and respect towards your parents. Uh, there is a story, Buddha story. Um, during Buddha's time, there's a lady, um, she's the queen, I think. Um, uh, there is a scenario, things happening, and she's trying to seek help from Buddha because they were imprisoned. So this queen and this king was imprisoned by their own son. There's past karma going on. Long story short, uh, ask the Buddha any place where I can escape from this pain, world of pain, you know, being betrayed and all that. And Buddha say, yes, uh, there's Pure Land. So how do I get to Pure Land? And so she selected Pure Land and Buddha tell him, you need to um, start by having the um, three foundations of going to Pure Land, three foundational deeds. The first of the three foundation is which is be filial to your parents, love and respect to your parents, your elders, and then um, respect your teachers, listen to the teachings, act, act, realize it, practice it. But dedicate these good deeds to Pure Land, not to the worldly fortunes. Uh, yeah, that's how you get there. Okay. Uh, follow the, in accordance with the conditions to uh, eliminate the past doings, the past karmas, you know, whatever opportunity arises, take it as a chance, chance to wash away our past karma, when we receive it without hatred, without greed, we're able to let it go, and then we're able to cleanse our karma. Uh, Venerable himself, uh, Venerable Chanda himself has a friend, he felt his friends um, so he himself so he felt his friends were always negative pessimistic uh, rarely smile rarely laughed you know, very cooped up depressed yeah, even his laugh it's very forced it's very um, people with that you know depressed with very depression obviously have something on their mind you know something heavy on their mind so he's trying to find out why am i so depressed why am i so cooped up 
So he find and find and find. He think about his relationship with his mom. It's some conflicts maybe. And so when he was seven years old, his parents brought him back to the um, maternal grandma's house. Uh, so maternal grandma and grandpa, um, you know, taking care of him when he was seven years old for two years. His parents, you know, left him at his grandma's house for two years. Well, you know, being a kid, and he couldn't understand why my parents, you know, left me, uh, abandoned me. He has the perception, or oh, my parents abandoned me. So as a parent, it's always, you know, be very aware. So people who cultivate, right, we say no ego, let go of ego. One of the thing is, you, if you already have children or family members, we all need to let go of our um, perception and understand what they feel. There's also cultivations. Right? This, everywhere is cultivations. Everywhere is the opportunity to cultivate. Right? Parents cannot be too obsessed. Don't be too obsessed on your career, on your jobs. You forgot about, you know, your own children's feeling, your own children's, you know, needs. Especially they're so tender and young, they need your attention most. And they don't understand if you don't tell them. They will, they will not understand if no one tells them. So this happens to this um, gentleman when he was seven, right? And because no one tells him why parents really need to work hard to take care of you, he, no one tells him that. And he felt maybe his fault or stuff like that. And he, you know, think entirely different things. That is not the truth. But he, no one tells him. So sometimes if we're getting too busy, right, find a place, find a chance to slow down, um, reflect. Have I moved too fast? Forgot about what really matters, right? So, Venerable himself, um, he has a very respected um, uncle uh, who passed away in a car crash. And because he really looked up to his uncle, you know, Venerable when he was young, he couldn't sleep. Because the passing of his beloved uncle hits him really deeply. And his parents already practiced Buddhism. And of course, young people, um, because he was young, he didn't, you know, get used to life and death situation. And having this happens hits him. But one day he think it through. You know, he sees through this. He um, sees things through. Finally, these thoughts obst obstruct himself um, from moving forward. So as parents, you need to be more attentive to their children's expression, especially their eyes. The eyes can speak thousands of words, right? The expression of your eyes uh, says a lot. Uh, anyone else as well. I mean, they, when there is problem, when you look at the expression, especially from the eyes, people will know. Yeah. And if communication is established and maintained throughout the entire life, nothing's wrong. Because everything your kid has met, encountered, he or she will tell you what happened, you know, about everything they face, you know. They open up a topic because they think you you know, you be you can be talked to. However, if parents do not communicate with their children often, you know, just do their own thing and leave children to their own device. So what kids would do usually is they close it up. When they encounter things, they leave it cooped up inside, fermenting, not properly processed. So that's why it's important to communicate with your kids. Uh, if you have a children who talks to you even though they are like 20, 30 years old, it opens up to you 
hundred percent or as much as they can. That means they really, you know, trust you and really think you like you have a good communications with your children. That's very good. So my friend, uh, Menorbo's friend, uh, has always has harbored this kind of thought since we was seven. My parents doesn't want me. Right? Maybe because of my fault, which is not. And he always have the fear of being abandoned by his parents. So he's always trying so hard to be good, you know, to be a good boy. And too much, you know, too much of anything is an obstacle. You know, so normally it's natural, right? You just do your best and that's it. But now it becomes, he's trying to do something intentionally in order to win the heart of his parents. There's no need for that, right? And he was very smart person and he did very well, worked hard in his studies when he was young. But he never, he's too tense. Right? He's always trying to say, I'm trying, if I don't do number one in my study, my parents will abandon me. Something like that. Right? Because usually parents don't think like that. They don't, it's not a conditional thing, right? It's, I love you because you're my son, that's it. It's not something like you need to get number one in here and there, only then I love you. But lack of communication brings out this kind of, you know, mindset, unhealthy mindset. So now he's a doubt, talks to me and then, you know, he think it through. Uh, and then he goes to his mom. <laughs> It's sometimes he likes to, uh, you know, go to his mom and say, I love you. Uh, trying to, you know, get affection for his mom and dad. And his mom was like, you're already 60 years old. <laughs> Why do you still need to do that? Um, so it took him so many years. It took him 50 plus years to let go of this obstacle. At the age of 60. This is such a heavy burden uh, to have. Um, and when he released this burden, you know, when he talked to me again, that relaxation can be felt. You know, he's much more free. So the first one is, that's why we need to learn from the Bodhisattva Dijang, you know, treasure of the earth. It shows um, a normal love between parents and children. And love means communication and all that. So, yeah. Second is Bodhisattva Guan Yin. I think Guan Yin. Yes. Um, from Bodhisattva you know, Dijang to Bodhisattva Guan Yin. Bodhisattva Guan Yin is famous for compassionate towards all, right? What is about Guan Yin means compassionate towards all, listen to everyone's um, yearn for liberation for sufferings. So it extends from love to parents to love to everyone. And then third one is Bodhisattva Manjushri, which is wisdom. You cannot just love without any wisdom. It becomes spoiling people. So wisdom means what is right, what is wrong, what is Long lasting, what is not. Uh, the last one is Bodhisattva Pusian, which is universal worthy. That means you, um, everything you do, everything you say, came out from wisdom and compassion. And it's a perfection of a person, a being. Right? And the path towards that perfection is Bodhisattva universal worthy. You know, how do you be universally worthy? You know? So this Pure Land, the whole path towards Pure Land is the path of universal worthy. That's what we're practicing now. Um, so people who are compassionate, people with wisdom, able to see other people's... Um, strength. The point that makes them shine. Uh, and they always have a heart of you know, servicing people, helping people and always um, reflecting on myself have I done I mean have I done right have I do right by others have I you know truly you know 
selfless, or am I hurting myself? A person who is an upgoing trajectory in this path, they will always be aware of the thoughts. My thoughts is too extreme, too indulgy, or too hate, too much hatred. Uh, my speech, my action, too much. There's too much that able to adjust back you know, to equanimity. So going back to Bodhisattva Guan Yin, the compassionate one. Uh, Bodhisattva Guan Yin has a way to do it, to get sentient beings into enlightenment. Start with what they like, what they yearn. Use that point that they like, they yearn for, to as a means to get them into enlightenment, the path of enlightenment. Start from what they really want. Right? Use that as a hook, so to speak, as a bait, or well, more like a as a catalyst, as a hook to get them into understanding the importance of enlightenment. The objective never change. Always hope them to go on to the path of nirvana, path of you know enlightenment, path of uh, perfection of self being. So people who practice Buddha means this practice. People who practice the path of Buddha is called Bodhisattva. So that's why we need to walk the path of Bodhisattva. So what is the most important in this path? What's the important point we need to have in this path? Mindset. So if put in real example, I have observed on everyone else, right? Um, uh, the, the, the audience, uh, people who bring out the questions. There are many people asking me questions. A lot of them, uh, more than 50%, is about education of, of their younger children, of their kids. They have a lot of issues in you know how to lead, how to educate their kids. <laughs> and uh, of course in my sutra we talk about going to Pure Land to be Buddha but they have a lot of pressing matters at hand they're trying to solve um, so they can't really focus on getting there because they need to worry about their present problem which is taking care of their kids educating their kids make sure they are well cared, set up well so we should offer the wisdom from our experience towards these people towards them solve their pressing problems. Uh, so this is what I learned from Master Ching Kong. Uh, so what I would say is I learned from Master Ching Kong. So he shared a few very important points, relevant points. And he say and then he said it came from Master Ching Kong. Everyone will take up you know the teachings of Master Ching Kong and try to listen to much as much to try as they can and solve it. Of course everyone has different background and conditions and you know, it has to be tailor made. Right to according to how close we are to them and stuff. Uh, it's common to say it's fair to say a lot of people has their own. Everyone has their own knot trying to untying. Every household has their own problems to solve. Uh, it's very hard to get your peace of mind nowadays as well. First thing is your, um, you know, the um, ongoing troubles in the heart that's internal problem and external and temptations technologies and all that distracting us some people say that um, the problems of 20th century is cancer problem of 21st century is mental health depression one of them is depression the problems of the heart right? 20th century is the problems of the body 21st century is the problems of the heart. So how do we solve the problems of the heart? We need to use the medicine, remedy for the heart. Dharma is the remedy of the heart. Wisdom is the remedy of the heart. Compassion is the remedy of the heart. So that's why Buddhism, the sutra say that it's uh, always have the vow to help sentient beings to open the path to the Dharma wealth, the wealth you know, of the heart. Uh, and then you you know, donate, give all the 
material assistance. So not just the material part, also the heart part. Twenty-three years ago, I was uh, one of the um, teachers in a school. Two thousand one, um, there was a lady. There's a you know, uh, student. She um, has uh, a lot of um, scars, self-inflicted scars on her hand, on her arms. I uh, looked at it and felt like. Like I told her, like your par your body came from your parents. Uh, you shouldn't harm yourself. Back then, I'm not aware of um, the situation of depression. Um, and then later on, I realized this is a epidemic, mental health epidemic. Uh, and then I go deeper and understand maybe you know, the kids have more um, family issues. She grew up in a very troublesome family uh, and all these conflicts all these um, sufferings that she encountered in family household cooped up inside uh, to a point where she has to express it and because it's cooped up not properly processed she uses this self-inflicted harm uh, suicidal behavior to remedy it which is not the remedy but yeah, to express it that's why, no matter how terrible it is among the world of adults, we should not bring back home or we should not carry, pass down this, bring back home these negative emotions or negative temper to our kids. Especially at that tender age. It's like, the most example is parents arguing, conflict between mom and dad in front of children, right? It leaves a scar in the kid's heart. Alright. And the responsible parents should always be aware of their actions and deeds. Try to solve it without affecting the kids. Another example I used to bring up, a twenty year old student suddenly stand up and keep saying my mom doesn't want me my mom doesn't want me he was also weird why he say that why he say that without you know unintentionally un un so he called his mom like I don't know why I keep having a thought that you don't want me mom says why wouldn't I want you you're my kid so when the mom finished the call of the kids she realized that when she had her son, she actually wanted to abort him, abort him. She wanted to, you know, abort his kid. Only under the, um, you know, the, his grandmother, his own mother, his, this kid's grandmother stopped her from doing it. Only that he has successfully been born. So this mindset, like even though his kid was not fully born yet, it's already passed on to him. Uh, another case is the parents you know, divorce. When parents divorce, remember it has to be, no matter how many emotions are there when a, a parents divorce, between adults, keep it between adults. Do not leave that emotions in front of children. Like, for example, always criticizing each other in front of kids, right? Even though uh, mom and dad might be separated. And this kind of impact to a student is too much. It might destroy them. And they might become, you know, twisted in their behavior. So, 9 out of 10 is emotions. Able to control your impulse, your emotions able to put it right in front of the right situation, right in front of kids, the right kind of um, way to solve the problem. It's very important. Do it rationally, do it peacefully. If anything else, for the kids. So, 
So I talk. Um, oh, back then I didn't know any better. If I knew this much, this depth, you know, this uh, depth of this problem, uh, I would have talked to the kids, you know, this um, go student. You know, hopefully, mentor her out of this trauma as well. Right. Or maybe just let her have a venue to talk about this problem. Because back then, when that wise, so, yeah, wisdom is very important and then convenience as well. And one of the best examples um, of giving convenience to the sentient beings to for them, you know, a value for them to relief for their suffering. Um, you know, Bodhisattva Guanyin is a state of mind, and so as much as it is a person, uh, a Bodhisattva, she has, um, she or he has um, um, manifested in many forms throughout history. There's a lot of situation of Bodhisattva appearing in different stages, different forms according to the image of the sentient, of the people, of the object, of the people who want the help. So one of the examples is Bodhisattva appears as a very, very beautiful lady, young lady. And she, her image is carrying a basket. And she passed through a village. So from the perspective of the village, everyone was like, oh, there's a beautiful uh, young lady coming to the, near the rivers next to the village to, you know, fish. Of course, a lot of young men uh, in the village trying to pursue her because of her beauty. Everyone's trying to you know, ask for a hand in marriage. And this um, young lady was like, so many people asking for my hand, uh, how do I find out which one is the right one? So what she did is she took out a heart sutra and say to the village, young man, anyone who can recite, who re memorize and recite the heart sutra, I will marry them, I will marry him. So everyone immediately go home and memorize the entire heart sutra. Right. So there's still many candidates. So she brings out another longer volume of sutra. Um, anyone who can memorize this sutra, I will marry her. So people came out. After three days, there are seven people who can memorize this longer volume of sutra. Of course, not enough. I mean, too much people. So she brought out one of the longest volumes of Buddhist Sutra. Uh, uh, one of the sutras. Sorry, I forgot the name. Fahua Sutras. And say, anyone who can memorize this, you know, Opus Magnum of can marry me. So the last person, who, there's only one person, who goes by them. The name Ma. So Mr. Ma and this young lady married. When they finish their marriage, marriage, they're trying to you know, consummate the marriage. On the first night, before they consummate it, this young lady has a stomach ache. Then pass away right after. So they didn't do anything. So it's heartbroken. Mr. Ma is heartbroken, right? Because he asked the hand of marriage, and now she passed away. So there's a monk came after a year, a year after the incident. Talk about this situation. And Mr. Ma talked about this. And the whole village talked about this. The monk was like, "This is actually a Bodhisattva Guan Yin. This is actually the Bodhisattva's uh, manifestation." The point is because everyone in this village fishing for life, fishing is killing his negative karma, and it will yield the karma of getting killed. So, trying to educate, how do you educate? Using the, what they really want, right? Which is beautiful woman and all that. And then to use that as a mean for them to understand the culture. Um, so, if you don't believe me, the monk says, open up the um, 
open up the um, coffin of this um, deceased young lady. So Mr. Ma opened it up. There's no one in there. Because after a year, right, it is not fully decomposed. So no one is in there. That proves that this is a what is up. So this is a performance. A good performance. A, com a way to do com use convenience to help essential beings to understand cause and effect, understand Buddhism. And that range of helping is unlimited, very far wide. As long as that person has something that they can work on and help with, Bodhisattva will help. Even those people who seem helpless or hopeless, they will also help. Um, this is the this is the action of someone who is very who has boundless compassion, right? Not just compassion to your parents, boundless compassion. Because people with boundless compassion do not think about how troubles them is, how long time can she is. People without boundless wisdom could not have think of any idea like that, or could not have attained the level of. Understanding of connection with the sentient beings like that. Um, yeah, using all sorts of convenience, all means of convenience, just to awake, just to wake up the sentient beings, just to wake up the people, to get them awakened. No longer stuck. Because everyone's different, everyone needs different things into the same place. Hence, you have the situation we have now, which is uh, different schools of Buddhism, different yana, right? Mahayana, Hirayana, Theravada, etc. Different traditions. Those are all tailored towards the receivers, right? towards the people in that group, in the area, in the culture. Not all sentient beings, however, of course, not all sentient beings can accept it. Um, about the um, Dhamma or Sai Muni Buddha, uh, 49 years of uh, giving the Dhamma. 49 years. It's all about, um, there is sequence in his teaching. He don't just say, he start by um, building the foundations. Uh, and when he talk about this Sutra of uh, you know, where, you know, um, everyone can become Buddha. Uh, uh, there are 5,000 people who uh, retreat from the, um, some people, if you introduce to them only once and they accept it, it's not normal. Because once they, once they actually accept it, they do it and they become Buddha. Uh, so this is like uh, people who can accept, like Pure Land. Pure Land is very famous for it's hard to believe because you just chant Amitabha, you don't have to do anything. <coughs> Alright, that's it. Um, so people can take it and do it immediately. They are not simple people. All right? Not simple as it seems. Because if you look at Shaimini Buddha, he has to take 49 years to get people to the point of accepting you know, the Mahay, uh, the Parin, I mean the um, Prashan Paramita, which is the top which is to become Buddha. Like, all this concept takes time to build in. Uh, so when we talk about Sutra Fahua, right? 
in Sutra, Fahua Sutra, there's a very famous um, Lotus Sutra. Thank you. Yeah, the Lotus Sutra, they have the um, very famous analogy, analogy of a house on fire. So this story goes by this: house on fire. Uh, kids are playing inside the house, even though it's on fire, and all the all the um, children are, you know, they only know how to play, they only play, they don't realize the situation, how dire it is. The father of these three kids, the owner of the house, wants to get the kids out to safety. So the kids are not listening to uh, and grows in their game, in their gaming. So he yelled at the kid and say, I got this um, goat cart. Horse cart and ox cart. Here's here's your pony, basically. Like you come out, there is a goat cart, ox cart, um, horse cart. So the kid was very um, happy at the, you know hearing the toys and then hop out of the house, and thus saving themselves, escaping from the you know fire. And when the kids came out, they are not getting the goat. They're not getting the horse, they're not getting the ox, not any ordinary cart. They got the rare white ox cart. So this is what Buddha did. He's trying to use you know, whatever the sentient beings could understand, the level of their understanding, tailored towards them, and then slowly lead them out of their um, shell, you know, which is burning, because it's not a safe place. And once they get out, they realize they got more they got much better bargain. They, they, they got it better than, much better than what they bargained. Um, so, these um, bodhisattvas who are appearing as monk or appear as lay Buddhists, you know, all sorts of status, um, they all listened to the Buddha when he shared his Lotus Sutra and this analogy. Everyone has gained enlightenment on the spot because they realize that they are actually talking about them. Uh, so only then they realize how important this Sutra is because it actually has directly benefits the people um, who really gets it. And that's why there are 5,000 people who retreat because they couldn't understand it at the time. Uh, nirvana, par Parinirvana. So the eight, because there are eight stages of spinning the Dharma wheel, of expounding the Dharma. Um, the last one is Nirvana. So just now we just talked about the seventh. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much, Amitabha.